God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written for you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the dark night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as indeed you are doing. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks, journey 
summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my, my own and with interest. So take, the talent, so take the talent from him and give it, give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Oh yeah? Praise to you, Lord Christ. <laughs> seated. Many of you know I like to uh, pop the hood and look under the, the hood to see what's going on in there sometimes, spiritually speaking, and this is a good time to do that. How accurate do you think your view of God is? <laughs> your sense your sense of God. On a scale from one to ten, where would you put yourself? Based on any reason. Two. Two? That's it. That's within the Episcopal margin. Actually, what I aim for. Have we secretly settled into an inadequate view of God? Have we made God in our own image? And what image is that? I like Anne Lamott, who said, you know you have made God in your own image when God hates all the people you hate. <laughs> we shape God's image in our lives. Have we convinced ourselves that we are objective observers of the nature of God? But do we see God or do we project 
on to go. Earlier in Matthew 6, there's this amazing statement by Jesus who describes the eye as the lamp of the body, which puzzles me. I see the eye as the lens through which you see what's really there. But Jesus understood spiritual sight as something we create, something that enlightens the world. So it's proactive. How you see the world will, will impact your behavior. Jesus understood that we are influenced by something deeper when we see things or we look at things. Our world perspective, perhaps. Our emotional state, perhaps. Our unresolved suffering, perhaps. And that world perspective is shaped by our deepest experiences, which, if left to themselves, turn into negativity, anxiety, anger, depression, even despair. The eye is influenced by what is deep within, and what is deep within often goes unexamined if we let leave it to our own devices. Apparently, Einstein once said, the most important question a person can ask is, is the universe a friendly place? Why? Because where we start influences what we see and what we look for. And Meister Eckhart, mystic of the 13th century, put it this way, the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. That's scary. <laughs> he is not saying that we control God's view of us, but rather how we see the world will always force God into our categories. This week I read numerous commentaries on this parable of the talents, and all of them simply accepted that the landowner was Jesus' depiction of God. Almost universal. Well, and so most of their concern was focused on trying to explain the harshness of God. This, I believe, is a mistaken assumption, and it results from ignoring two words in the parable, which says, you knew, did you? that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. It's the did you, did you, those two words open this parable up. You knew, did you? Really? You knew that? Did you? If you miss those two words, you think this is what the nature of God. But this poor, fearful, frightened, stingy, scared individual bases his action on his view of the master. Now the others say, I knew you were an awful human being, and you gather this or you take from other people. Only he said that. It is his image of God that led to his behavior. And our image of God leads to our behavior. What is our image of God? Einstein. Is the universe, or our spiritual state for that matter, what does that look like? Do we feel positive, hopeful, loved, does our behavior flow from that? So how do we tend to our view of God? We cannot do it alone. That's one of the images of God that we might have. It's up to me. God expects this of me. I have to figure it out on my own. I don't have to rely on other people. Paul echoes this same understanding in his letter to the church in Thessalonica. 
as they were facing a season of turbulence. He said, therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. Curtis Almquist, a brother at the Society of St. John the Evangelist, said that part of their monastic foundation rests on encouragement, which they describe as their daily bread. Right at the basis of Christian community is a call to encouragement. How often do we encourage other people? How often do we open up? Because this is the access to an image of God is a being, you know, allowing our, ourselves to be seen by other people and letting them in. Encouragement is an amazing thing. It comes from the French word for heart. Curtis says, encouragement will bind up the brokenhearted, just as Jesus promises us. Every day, we can offer encouragement by building up the dignity, amazing worth, wonderful witness, giftedness, and essence of another's loveliness. This will change their day and change their lives and make an eternity of difference. Encouragement will convert someone's fearful heart or lonely heart or a heart of stone into the new heart that God promises. Encouragement is how courage gets into our hearts. Encouragement produces courage. Encouragement makes us strong, very strong. It is as simple and profound as that. Encouragement. You have the need and you have the power. This is the role of Christian community. We come here to encourage one another. We are part of a body and we are reliant upon our relationships to encourage us, to help us create a bigger view of who we are and what God means to us. If left to our own devices, our own mean judgments, according to Curtis, we will almost inevitably score poorly. We could have been, should have been better, don't we know? There's no way out of this downward internal spiral unless we are rescued by love. It's otherwise hell, all the way to hell. We are secretly condemned and sentenced to a lifetime and eternity of inadequacy failure and estrangement unless we are rescued by love. Someone who will bequeath dignity, worth, recognition, and gratitude upon us. Encouragement for us because of who we are and what we do. We simply cannot grasp this alone. That we are precious and amazing and of inestimable value unless this truth is mirrored into our being by another person. We need to give and receive support, encouragement for one another as daily bread. How does this affect our view of God? Because if we're not being encouraged, we will feel alone. And what does loneliness do? Loneliness nurtures a distant God, a disconnected God, one that isn't with us and walks with us through whatever we're facing. If we're feeling inadequate, that nurtures a view of a judgmental God. I'm not good at it. I haven't done enough yet. If we are in despair, that rids God of it, God's existence. God simply doesn't exist. See, it's not just an intellectual image that we create God in. It is a soulful image that we bring. And we need help with our souls, and that comes through encouragement. You know, and he, he makes this point, which is really, I think, actually quite profound. You need encouragement. 
especially if you do things really well. If you bring sustenance and delight to other people's lives, and you are dependable, but in a kind of paradoxical way, the better you perform and the more dependable you are, the less likely you will hear praise and gratitude. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> People just think, it emanates from you. Surely you know you are wonderful. Surely you know how grateful we are for you. Surely. But you actually don't know this. If people depend on you for something, I love this phrase, you are not down and out, but rather up and out. You need to be remembered and thanked and encouraged. This is an amazing thing. And you're probably not going to admit it unless you blow up or break down and lose your veneer. You're not going to admit it, but you need to be remembered and thanked, supported, and encouraged. This is part of our spiritual evolution. This is how we create and relate to God. This is how we relate to ourselves. We relate to ourselves, to God, through people, through the gift of encouragement, through the gift of love. Curtis ends his thoughts with a call to action, and I'll end my sermon with it. Encouragement is a need we all have. Encouragement is a power we all have. Unleash that power. Practice it. Even if you're running short on re receiving encouragement, practice encouragement, and you will reap what you sow. In their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. 
danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For, For all who proclaim the gospel, and, and all who seek the truth. For Michael Curry, our, our presiding bishop, Mark Andrus, our bishop, the vestry, wardens, clergy, and staff of St. John's, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, remembering this week in our cycle of prayer, Glynis and Jim, Sandra Davidson, Scott Davidson, Jean Eccles, Elizabeth Ann, Fred Felder, Drew Fleming, Elizabeth Halliday, Sharon Hoffman, Pat Hook, Vicki Howe, Janet, Joan Kimber, Judy Kreidel, Katie Koch and Joe Finelli, and for all those suffering because of war, especially in Gaza, Israel, and Ukraine. Joining with Archbishop Hossam Naum, the patriarchs and the heads of churches in Jerusalem, Pope Francis and Archbishop Justin Welby, we pray fervently for all those caught in violent conflict. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as children of one God, to whom he be dominion and glory, now and forever. Amen. 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 Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, remembering this week Max Elvins, David and Ann Talbot, Jennifer Heron, and Bill Stebbins. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We would bear trust in you. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace.
Announcements. Uh, Lila? I decided to get close to the beach. Hello, everyone. We've had two pledge Sundays, and people have submitted pledges. Only about half of the congregation so far has submitted pledges. We are going to begin phone calls for the church operating board. <laughs> December 1. So, you have two more weeks of grace to get those in and save us those calls. Um, the other thing is, today following the service, a couple of us are going to start writing thank you notes to those who have pledged. Uh, anyone who would like to join that effort will be doing it after this Sunday and after next Sunday. And then hopefully, beginning December 1, we'll be able to thank the rest of the community. Please. And thank you for those who have pledged. Thank you for your pledges. Thank you. Well, just throw it. <laughs> no, <laughs> just a quick announcement. Um, you will notice on the table out in front that there is a sign-up sheet for coffee hour. Um, if you enjoyed last Sunday and the Sunday before, you could be a part of it. And apparently somebody did it this Sunday because it looks great. So it's a lovely thing to do. Look at the person next to you and say, hey, do you want to do next Sunday? Um, it's really easy. So sign up. What? Next Sunday? What? You know what? It's through April, I think. So you got a lot of time. Um, Ray. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. What a great sermon. I, I added it into these remarks. I'm speaking to you about why I'm here and why I give. And you've probably noticed by now that we are in a particular time of year, pledging time, money time, which is one of the ways that we show that we want to be and do church together. I'm going to tell you why I give. You are my people. You are my priest and you listen to me when I need you. You are my comforter. When I need a hug and consoling and need to cry like when my best friend Barbara was dying five years ago or so, I would find somebody in the parking lot and ask for a hug or maybe look a little bent over and somebody would come and hug me. It made all the difference. You're my friends. I can tell you my secrets. I used to have a big secret about my stepfather 
which Kathleen and I, we both spoke at the great vigil a while back, and I told the secret, and it made all the difference. So you're good listeners, too. And encouragers about that in particular. During the summer, this past summer, I was in rage and despair, while what should have been Bill's and my forever last home was rent asunder by poor management and not caring for us elders. And boy, was I mad. I was furious. Steve Hassett was preaching that Sunday, so I unsuspectingly catched some time from him. And I told you all how I was feeling because it was, it was my rage, I could not control it. It would be sparked by small portions, bad food, this and that. And I wasn't like liking the person I was becoming being rage-filled. So Steve gave me some time. I shared that with all of you, and I got beautifully ministered to and encouraged through that which is now over, by the way. We're moving to Rossmore next week. Problem solved. <laughs> Took some doing, but the, the winning, winnowing was already done because we went from a big house to three rooms, and now we're going to a different three rooms in a different place. Problem solved. I am known here and loved anyway. <laughs> is that maybe the definition of family? I leave it to you. You don't have to answer that. But wahoo, I'll tell you, that is the best. In this place, among all of you, I have found myself. I have found friendship. I found connections. I found forgiveness. I found love. I found my capabilities, and they've been allowed to flourish. I'm talking to you right here, now, in public, to people with a mic. I found forgiveness. I found healing. And gratitude is what inspires me, and it shows up in sharing my gifts. Really, who could resist you? Not me. I've been here since 1985. God is truly in this place. You are my people. You. And you. And you and you and you and you. I was going to say something about Father Guido, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Scott said it. I, I thought he was pretty funny. I'm rescued by your love, and that makes all the difference. Thank you. Ray, as you know, does a lot of things with color in this place. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. On December 10th, is, uh, Pastor Vinny is coming to speak after the service, but we're also having, for the third time, a craft bazaar to benefit his mission for the homeless. Ray has agreed to have a jewelry table. And you may bring your own jewelry. She's bringing a lot of her own. Put your own prices on it, and all the proceeds will benefit the mission for the homeless. Oh, that's great. But this is just so emblematic of the type of thing that she does. And you can't, can only imagine all the jewelry that she herself is going to be contributing to this car. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and don't forget, all those coat racks out there are for uh, the ministry uh, to the homeless as well. We invite you to bring coats. Uh, blankets uh, and uh, shoes and socks and that's all and that is all uh, so uh, they're picked up every Thursday so when he comes here all that goes back out onto the street so we invite you to be a part of that uh, and uh, uh, looking ahead also before December 10th we have Dece December 2nd it's Saturday two things uh, I ask you to consider. One is, please uh, go to uh, listen to the Bishop candidates. Uh, and we'll send those links out again. You can watch their reports online, their interviews. And we would love to hear what you think and our deanery delegates would like to know. Uh, because they will represent you on the election on December 2nd uh, for the new bishop. So this is an important time in our diocese, and we appreciate your discernment and uh, your advice to us. So please do that. But we'll be coming from Grace Cathedral back to St. John's uh, after that vote uh, for Advent night from 4 to 7 that evening. December 
second. And it's just a wonderful time. It's just great. Um, hope you watched the video that was in the Friday email. It gives you a sense of what happens. We, we pull out ladders. We decorate it. The children are here. It's very intergenerational. Uh, there's great food. Uh, there's crafts to do. There's lights to put up. And we ready this space for Advent. And it's just uh, traditionally called the greening of the church. And so we invite you to be a part of that as well. Um, am I missing anything? Lori survived the kayak. Lori yes. survived the kayaking, the kayaking trip. trip. Yes. Yes. She is, Lori is still upstairs? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Yes, God bless Lori yes. for uh, all that she does. And uh, uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, and I, I, I really mean that because uh, she's had a bad cough and uh, maybe allergy or some other things, but uh, she's having a, a trouble ridding herself of that. So uh, uh, please keep her in your prayers. Are there birthdays, anniversaries, transitions we can acknowledge today? Over. Let us, with joy-filled hearts, offer the fruits of our life and labor to God.
The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give God thanks and grace. grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs>
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome. Thank you. 
us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you.